So a very good evening, everyone. And uh, I would like to heartily welcome you to this webinar series. It's for four days on virtual learning in nursing education, which is an emergency uh, paradigm. And uh, I would like to, on behalf of Amity College of Nursing and Amity University Haryana, I would like to heartily uh, welcome Ms. Shiny Edward, ma'am, uh, Professional Development Specialist, uh, Baylor Scott and White Medical Center, Plano, and Heart Hospitals, Plano. And we welcome you, ma'am. And uh, I would also like to welcome our beloved principal, ma'am, uh, Professor Dr. A. Tenu Selvi, and my co-organizers, Mr. Uh, Surinder Sharma and Ms. Timpi Raheja, all my colleagues, all the participants, and my dear students. So whenever we talk about virtual, whenever we say we hear the word virtual, it, is, it sounds always futuristic, you know. But little has changed in 2020, and uh, as we all know, the pandemic. So we all teachers, we are, you know, we have to, we are asked to teach online, and in order to provide the ongoing education to uh, our learners. And uh, it's not only that, it's uh, all the professional organizations, you know, even the biggest conferences, either it is done partially or sometimes completely digital. So on the other hand, if we talk about students, students, they have the advantage of leveraging the uh, digital simulation platform and which is totally different from a traditional uh, classroom. So we have seen uh, like many fields changing from live streaming, live tweeting. So uh, the main aim of this webinar is you know, to see the virtual, the virtual in, uh, learning or clinical simulation, whether you know, the techniques and uh, the difficulties, pros and cons, whatever involved in this, you know, so that it can act as a facilitator for the students, for knowledge retention, clinical reasoning, as well as uh, satisfaction of learning. So once again, I welcome all of you to this webinar and uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. And before we start, I would like mm -hmm. to request uh, Principal Ma'am to uh, share a few words with us before we start the webinar. Please, Ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Uh, it is uh, our great pleasure to welcome uh, Ms. Saini, business person for this webinar. And she is a uh, great speaker and clinician and professional developmentalist. And uh, I know she is an eminent person and uh, she is uh, doing uh, escape room gaming. So usually when we uh, invite people, they prepare and come and speak. But today she is here to share her experience because she is on day-to-day -day basis, she practiced this escape room gaming technique. So when we look into the topic, everyone wonder what is this escape room technique or escape room gaming? Because we are all used to learn through PowerPoint presentation. So many times, even in the classrooms, we see the students will not respond to us and they feel boredom, the students. And even the teachers will complain like the students are not listening and they just want the PowerPoints, they read it even after the classroom. Yeah. So they feel bored and they don't show much interest and that will be the major complaints of many of the teachers. But when we look into this uh, escape room uh, gaming, it is in really a game the students will enjoy, but they learn the concepts concretely. So at the end of, end of this escape room gaming technique, the students definitely learn the concept and concretely they learn and that will be very, very much useful to the students. So they feel very interesting. And uh, so that is what we feel uh, and we have invited uh, Ms. Shiny Edward for this session to share her experience. I know she is well versed and on day to day basis, she practiced this and uh, so this knowledge should be disseminated to all our nursing professional and educators and clinicians. So this will help everyone to adopt an newer technique in teaching the students 
even our junior nurses and in the clinical side or anyone which will be very interesting and the students definitely they will not lose their interest and they will show much interest in learning the nursing concepts with this small introduction i think i hand over the session to saini edward thank you so much for that wonderful introduction my name is shiny edward i'm one of the professional development specialist working for baylor scott and white heart hospitals at plano mckinney and denton it's a regionalized uh, hospital department that's why i keep saying like i work for all three hospitals because the educational needs in these three hospitals is met by the education department at this hospital at plano So professional development specialist actually means a clinical nurse educator. I've been with Baylor from 2002. I worked in several inpatient units starting from med surg, I moved to ortho, I moved to progressive care, I moved to ICU, I moved to CVICU, I worked in ED, then I worked in neuro and then I moved to education. So from 2014 I have been with education department and in 2018 I moved to regionalized education department here at Plano. So thank you for that wonderful introduction and I will go ahead and start sharing my screen, right? Ma'am if I may I will just I just uh, need to tell the participants in case mm -hmm. anyone have any questions you just drop into the question and answer box and we'll okay. be discussing it this after the session. Okay, perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm guessing now it's good. You can see? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, why I am fascinated with escape room and why we do escape room techniques at uh, Baylor Hospital, it's to really help the nurses adapt to the change you know the nurses i'm getting are actually new graduate nurses you know yesterday someone was telling me nursing professional development npd it, we should be called as new product development so we get the product from nursing schools and they we the hospital hires them and my job is to train them effective efficient nurses who can take care of our patients in heart hospital and the nurse is competent she or he knows how to uh, look up the protocols of our hospital to know the policies of the hospital and which doctor to call which team to call if the patient's condition is clinically deteriorating So ultimately my aim within education department is to make a nurse who is efficient equitable uh, she or he is able to provide patient centered care safe care timely care for the patients and often the nurses like we are currently doing an internship program where we are training the nurse who got out of nursing school to work in a tele unit where all patients are monitored you need to know how to read the patient's heart uh, rhythms you need to know how to give certain medications you need to know what to monitor things like that and she was telling me she feels very scared and that's what's called that reality shock so as an educator i am also trying to minimize this reality shock and help these nurses transition to practice in an effective way okay so the today's topic is escaping the traditional classroom teaching in nursing school and i'm giving you ideas on developing and implementing an escape room in nursing school or in your hospitals you can change this to whichever way it suits for your benefits okay so at the end of this presentation i am hoping that i have conveyed uh what's the application of escape room gaming techniques 
how you will be able to develop a plan to implement escape room in your facility and how you will debrief with the students at the end of this escape room gaming technique. So I'm sure you are all wondering what this escape room is. So escape room just, it just means it's actually a room which has locked, which has been locked and the team of students right now because of COVID, I can not let more than three students be in one room. So in this room, there are several puzzles, there are several clues, there are um, hidden uh, ideas. The students or the new hire nurses, they should solve the puzzles, they should connect those clues, and they should accomplish the task of escaping the room. So it's like a live action, team-based games where the player discovers clues, solve puzzles, and accomplish tasks in one or more rooms in order to escape the room. So whenever I do an escape room with my new hires, if they are able to get out of the room in time, because I've given them a definite time, within 15 minutes, they should be able to solve all the clues and get out of the room or save the patient for that matter. So I will give them a t-shirt saying that I escaped the room on such and such day. So even there is a little background as to why I love clues and puzzles because growing up as a child, I loved reading riddles and solving riddles. And I saw the same with my own children. You know, when I read them Vikram Vethal stories, they loved understanding the story and trying to answer the question at the very end. It could be an ethics question. It could be a silly question, you know, but they loved uh, solving clues and solving puzzles. And growing up, I noticed the same with adults too. We don't want to do the routine things. We want fun. We want to be more engaged. We want participation. We want our own, our students to actively participate. So those are the reasons why I chose escape room as an active engagement participation thing with the students or the new hires at my hospital. So the other reasons I have often come across during teaching is my new hires complaining that the class is long. Yes, it's boring. It's from eight to five, sitting in a classroom, listening to the presenter, listening to the facilitator and making notes. I have read in articles saying that <clears throat> after 45 minutes, the attention span is drastically reduced. So long classes, having an eight hour class on whatever material the department requested after 45 minutes, if you are not having you know, some kind of uh, you know, change in activity, you will often see kids sitting in the classroom and actually dozing off. You'll see disengaged learners. And another issue was money. Money is always an issue. If we could buy programs like you know, Essential for Critical Care Orientation, it's a virtual program. It's uh, by American Association of Critical Care Nurses. They provide a program, it's a package. You assign it to the students, it's all modules. They will sit and do the modules. There is no hands-on or there is no, uh, like virtual simulation is there, there's no real touch. But it costs a lot of money to buy that program. And another thing, educating the traditional way the didactics, you know, the presenter stands there and talks and talks and talks. And often you will hear them use the word death by PowerPoint. Because I myself, I'm friends with quite a bit of educator who loves using PowerPoints. Some of their PowerPoints have like 275 slides and writing the entire paragraph on the PowerPoint. That is very distracting and it's literally death by PowerPoint after five, 10 slides, you see them completely disengaged, playing on their phone, 
looking out the window, not actively participating at all. And I needed to see how I can build in the soft skills, you know, how this new nurse is interacting with the patient. We call the heart hospital actually is a for-profit hospital. They call the patients clients. They have uh, several programs where they teach a nurse or any members of the medical team how to interact with the patient. They call their patients clients. They can order, it, it looks like a hotel. The hospital actually looks like a hotel. So the body language, how they are going into the patient's room, how they are introducing themselves. Are they using things like AIDID, A's for acknowledging, then introducing self, uh, telling the patient how long you will be working with them and thanking them at the very end of every interactions. So those kinds of soft skills I needed to see. And another one is at this hospital, Baylor Hospitals, we have hired new nurses who are, we do get some nurses who, who has nursing as their second career, but majority of them are millennials. So I have like, I was looking at the number, 28.7% of the nurses who were hired into our Baylor system are millennials. And you know millennials, how much they love their technology. Even my, my daughter, my kids, both my children, they love watching uh, Tamil movies now, Tamil, Hindi, Korean, all those movies. And yesterday my younger one was correcting me because I told her one of the actor was Shiva Kartikeyan, something I said. And she corrected me, no, that's not him. That's this person. And do you know uh, that movie star's actual name? Because why? Because they do fact checking. They have the phones with them. They use the Siri. You know, my, my daughter doesn't even want to look up the temperature. She just asks Alexa, what is the temperature outside? Siri, can you solve this? Siri, can you find this? Because they want instant answers. They don't have time to read a 40 page articles or sit in a class for eight hours to understand the concept. They want instantly. So that was one reason why I always uh, wanted uh, something that will attract their attention and that will engage them more. And another thing with millennials is they're motivated by purpose. They often ask me, what is the need for me to learn that? What am I getting out of it? Why do I need to do that? Why can't I do it this way? So those kind of out of the box thinking you will get from millennials and they desire early advancement. Like two days ago to the newly hired nurses, I asked them, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? And one kid, one nurse, she told me she see herself as the chief nursing officer in five years. So uh, that was very surprising to me. If within five years, she's seeing herself as a CNO. I would have been so happy if she said, I would want to be the best nurse. I want to be a great clinician. Nothing. I want that early advancement. I want to advance through my stuff really quick. And they're accustomed to rapid information and distillation. No time, no time wasted, motivated by purpose. They don't really care about the ranks. That's another thing I have noticed. You could be the chief uh, nursing officer, but if you are not bringing something that they are looking for, they don't care. They don't care ranks, they care purpose. And another one is flipping the classroom rather than the uh, didactic portions completely done by the presenter. Sometimes you can collaborate with the students and say, okay, you work on this portion, you can present it tomorrow in the class. I will be the facilitator and asking them uh, ideas to make it better, make the classroom presentations better, more hands-on team approach, collaborate within the team and bringing them to those critical thinking, problem-solving ideas. And most of all, 
above all, I wanted to have some fun and I wanted to get my new hires to think like a nurse. Okay, so the idea of uh, escape room actually started with Dr. D. Fink's. He is a, Dr. D. Fink is a professor at a university in Oklahoma. And I have read his book. He wrote, he's, he wrote, uh, he's the author. Uh, the book's name is Creating Significant Learning Experience. That's the book. It's a very fascinating read. Uh, so in that book, he defined learning as learning is, learning occurs when there is a change. In order for learning to occur, there must be a change in behavior some kind of change. It could be a change in thinking, it could be a change in the practice, it could be change in learning itself. And uh, he said, for significant learning to occur, these are the things that needs to happen. First is the foundation knowledge. So since I work for Heart Hospital, majority of my stuff that I teach has to do something with heart pathology or things like that. So for example, when I was teaching um, heart failure using an escape room, my foundational knowledge, it just means you are helping your new hires understand and remember basic information. So when you talk to them about heart failure, the things that you want them to understand are terminologies or certain vocabularies like uh, heart failure itself, congestive heart failure, right-sided heart failure, left-sided heart failure, high output failure, low output failure. And you can also, you'll also be talking about preserved ejection fraction, reduced ejection fraction. Those are all the basic terminologies that you want your new hires to understand. So that is the foundational knowledge. Even though, you know, any classroom, there is knowledge occurring, but in order for you to have a significant learning, give them the foundation knowledge at first, basic vocabularies, basic concept. And the second thing is application. So once you have given them the basic terminologies, basic concepts, basic pathophysiology, now you're helping them to apply. So once you have, let's for example, heart failure itself, okay, you talk to them about high output failure and then you're bringing them, okay, to the application part of it. Like when you are telling them, what would a fluid res uh, re restriction do for a patient in heart failure? How it reduces the preload. And you're going to talk to them about uh, how, what are all the measures you'll be doing to reduce the afterload. What is the benefit of giving antihypertensive medications to your patients? So this is what I often think about my own teacher. I teachers, you know, I had at a PSG College. Um, one of the doctors there, his name is Dr. Bhuvaneshwar. He was the cardiologist there. And every even now when I teach my new hires, I think about how he did that classroom, how I got to do a significant learning in his classroom. What he did was he will come to the class, didn't have any PowerPoints, didn't have any handouts. He will tell you what happens to a patient who is in heart failure. And he will bring you to signs and symptoms without giving you the signs and symptoms directly. He will tell you, okay, your patient in left-sided heart failure is having an increased pressure in his left side. So with the increased pressure in his left side, what do you think will happen in the lungs? And he talked about um, S3 and S4 sounds, and I still remember him using his fingers on the table and making that gallop sound. So if I can remember stuff I learned in my college in 1997 and recreate that in 2019, 2018. Now I am honored to say that significant learning occurred in those classrooms. And just like uh, Dr. Tamir Selvi Madam said, she was my community health nursing professor. And I still remember going to her and answering the nutritional values of each uh, 
items. Now, at that time, it was difficult to remember all of it. But then now looking back, I'm like, okay, I am cooking such and such stuff for my kids. Okay, if she is deficit in iron, let me add some more of this product. So that is the application part. And integrating, making connections with information. Like, okay, if I am giving this medication in a heart failure patient, I need to monitor this. If the patient is being given a potassium sparing diuretic and an ACE inhibitor, I need to know the patient's potassium value like that. Then human dimension, learning about your own self. If I had this heart failure, these are the conditions that will happen to me. These are the conditions that the patient is going through and becoming more compassionate, becoming more caring, which is the next one. And learning how to learn. That is the integral part of them to have this continuing education. If you have given them great foundational knowledge, they know how to apply, they know how to integrate, they have that human dimension, they are more caring. The next thing what they will do is becoming a better student. They will, on their own, they will inquire about the subject, they will go to the library, they will, when they get a patient with this condition, they look into the, the, the patient's charts, they want to identify uh, more details. Like uh, at our hospital, we do left ventricular assist device. So when we have a vendor from HeartMate, I often see my new hires wanting to participate in that without me even telling them that this is something that is not mandatory because they are genuinely interested in understanding and learning more about the subject matter, okay? So next slide. So how you can develop um, escape room at your facility. So first think about the topics that you would like to uh, introduce your students or a suitable topic for the students and develop the objectives. So always work back. I often think, okay, once I'm done teaching this class, what do I expect my students to understand or to the student to learn? So I work kind of backwards. Okay, I want my students to understand heart failure and its side effects. So then I create the route. So first identify the object, uh, objectives, then you develop the escape route and purchase the necessary things because you are going to have all of this in a room. So right now at my hospital, what we do is we have it all set up in a sim lab. So in this simulation lab, I have a high fidelity mannequin. It's like very expensive mannequin that can do a lot of stuff for you, but you don't need those mannequins to do stuff at your facility. You can create puzzles, cut the puzzles, put it in several locations, hide it, uh, let the kids find it on their own and put it together. You can buy locks that has either numbers or just actual key and lock. And uh, you sometimes if you're writing secret messages on stuff, they might be needing to use a UV light to see it. So if you want to do that, you can buy that. And have a dry run, always run it with faculty itself to see whether they will be able to solve puzzles and what all modifications needs to be done and then set the stage in the classroom. Like if I am teaching a heart failure class, what I do is at the end of the class, I will say, okay, now that you have learned the pathophysiology, you know the medications, you know how to monitor your patients, you know our hospital's protocols and policy, now let's see whether you can save a patient. Let's go to the escape room. That's how I set the stage in the classroom. And the minute they hear escape room, they, they become like, oh, let's do that. They're very, very happy to do it. Even like there are escape rooms for adults too, like literal games. Like my kids really love going to these places where they are actually solving a murder mystery, things like that. So it's a very interesting uh, subject for the kids too. 
So this is the outline the, that we had at uh, Plano Hospital. So I gave them, after teaching the heart failure class, I gave them a scenario, okay? I said, okay, you will have a patient in this escape room. You will have to save her, okay? Then I take them to the escape room. The door of the escape room is locked. Okay, it's literally locked like that, okay? And uh, to get the entry to the room, they have to, because three kids, they have to come up with three to five symptoms a heart failure patient might present. So that's the first thing I will do. So after teaching the class, I take them to the escape room. Escape room door is locked. I ask them to say three or five symptoms a heart failure patient might have. And if they answer it right, and then I open the door for them or I will just give them the key, okay? So the next thing what I will do is once they are in the room, of course the room has hidden clues, room has logs, room has a computer that is logged, room has a medication box that is logged, and the room has a patient who is lying down, okay? So once the door is opened, I go to the Sim loop, uh, sim, simulation lab control room. So the students and myself, we are separated with a, like a transparent glass uh, window. I am able to see them. They are really not able to see me, okay? So once they are in the escape room and when I go to the sim lab uh, ad admin room, I watch what they do. So you have a patient there so I make the patient say that she's, uh, if depending upon which level interns I am educating, I have different objectives. If this is a newly hired, just starting transition to practice students, I don't expect them to do a detailed history and physical of uh, things like that. I want them to do the basic history and assessment. I want them to go to the patient and introduce themselves and ask her about her age, what made her come to the hospital, what is her living, you know, like advanced directives, things like that. So once they start asking those questions to my mannequin, mannequin will answer that she's 60 years old, she has past medical history of coronary artery disease, she has history of congestive heart failure, she has history of uh, chronic renal insufficiency and hypertension. And she says that she's at the hospital because she has nausea and vomiting and she's been having diarrhea for past 72 hours. So then the kids, the new hires, they are looking for what orders they have from the physician. So one order I will have for them is to start an IV fluid on this patient. So the orders will say normal saline, bolus 250 ml over one hour times two, then one liter over eight hours. So the first task that they have to complete is find the rate. What is the rate? And they have to select the right bag, okay? So if this was interns who are doing towards the end of ICU orientation, I want them to question that order. But for the team that I'm doing right now, I didn't ask them to question that order because that looks like way too much fluid for a patient with congestive heart failure. But here, my objective was to see whether they are able to calculate the rate because there is no pumps or anything in, the, um, in that sim lab. I want them to be able to do basic calculations. So they are able to calculate it right and the answer will be 125. And then they use that number to go to the medication box and enter that into the number lock and open the box, okay? So when they're opening the box and getting the right medication and trying to set all of this up, I change the patient's condition. Patient will be like clinically deteriorating a little bit. She will say that she's having issues with uh, dizziness. She's feeling like very lightheaded. She's having shortness of breath. And I want these three kids to respond immediately to the patient's concern. I don't want them to disregard and continue hanging the medication or the fluid. 
I want them to go to the patient and do a simple assessment. And I want them to take vital signs. And I'm going to set the vital signs to, you know, blood pressure is 90 over 55, heart rate is 110, uh, breaths per minute and uh, all that. Uh, Respiratory, respiratory rate is 22, temperature is 101. So because the patient is having breathing difficulty, I want them to assess the patient's saturation. So then they will look for the pulse ox, and in that pulse ox, I have hidden a clue to check the labs. Okay? So when they are checking the pulse ox, patient saturation is going to be barely like in early 90s then the patient is going to have real breathing, real bad breathing difficulty. And then my interns, they use that lab, L-A-B-S, it's a letter lock there. So they enter that into the box to retrieve the patients to the, that day's lab, you know. So they put that the letters into the box, they open the box, they will see several labs. There will be potassium, there will be creatinine, there will be BUN, there will be some EKG test results. All of that will be in that box. And I want my interns to pick the values that is abnormal because I'm not giving them any reference values because I've given them the basic education. They're, they should be able to link it and they should know this patient's potassium is 2.7 patient is hypokalemic, and then they will correlate that with the patient's uh, EKG. They will see depressed T waves. They will see PVCs. By this time, they are to immediately call the physician, ask them uh, for a you know, potassium replacement protocol. And I will watch to see how they are calling the physician because our hospital advises the nurses to call the doctors or any health team members using that S bar, you know, S stands for situation, B stands for background, A stands for your assessment, what the nurse is seeing. So this nurse has to say, the situation is the patient's history. Background is what all condition patient has. And assessment is, okay, I assess the patient, patient is having breathing difficulty. I looked at the patient's potassium, potassium is 2.7, and I looked at the patient's EKG, patient has some depressed T waves and PVC, and the recommendation, and what does the nurse recommend? And you have to say that, the recommendation to the physician. I was wondering whether I can get an order of potassium replacement protocol from you. So if they do that much, okay, then I'm, by this time, like they're giving them only 15 minutes to do all of this. So once they get to that point, I come out and I'm saying, congrats, you saved your patient. Okay? So that's the route that we use uh, for heart failure at the hospital I work, and I have rules for them. They have to work as a team because millennials, for some weird reason, they want to work in silo. You know, I noticed that I'm working on that with my own children. I call one of them, you know, to come downstairs to have dinner or lunch. And the other one, instead of going upstairs and getting my, the person, she will text her. They will be sitting close to each other, but I still find them texting or looking at their phone. So I don't want that to happen in a healthcare environment. I want them to work as a team. I want them to have a feeling that uh, all our patients, all the patients that's in the hospital are ours. It's not your patient. That's not my patient. They are our patient, you know, that kind. So they can ask for peer, my help three times and they are not allowed to use any electronic resource. You have to know the lab values. You have to know what number to call for rapid response. Most importantly, I want them to think like a nurse. Okay, so this is more detailed. Okay. okay. So after it's all done, I do debriefing with them. So they've been, uh, quite a few nurses who were not able to identify the EKG changes. 
and some of them didn't know which doctor to call because one patient will have a, uh, you know, admitting doctor, will have an internal medicine doctor, some might have a cardiologist, some might have a pulmonologist. So there's a group of doctors working for on one patient. But to get protocols, orders, you are supposed to call the admit, admitting physician. And if they are calling the cardiologist for that, uh, that's not the right route. And if they are not calling uh, the right team, so those are the things I talk about in debriefing. It's not to hurt their feelings or it's not to say, hey, why did you do it like that? Not like that. Most of the time they do the talking. The questions that I ask them is, what could I, I done better? What do you think went wrong? What could have been um, modified? What do you think? The participant does most of the talking. So this is the questions, routine questions I do. I saw this, I think, um, I wonder, and if some students is way off, I need to know why that action was not done because then I need to bring them to reality. Okay, so if you are not identifying this, if you are not looking at the patient's monitor, your patient is going to go into a, you know, ventricular fibrillation and could die. Because why I'm, I'm so bringing them to reality is we had a nurse who uh, did the medication reconciliation and instead of writing 0 0.125 milligram of digoxin, she wrote 1.25 milligram. And the patient was sent home and this was the patient's discharge instruction. So the next time when patient came, instead of talking to the patient and getting the medication list, this nurse just copy forwarded all that medication to the patient's current medication record. And she gave 10 of digoxin to the patient. So, and the patient, we had to send ambulance to the patient. You know, patient was discharged to, to the patient's house and bring the patient back. So there's, you know, if they are not doing the right action, I, I give them a little bit of scare. It's a reality situation, reality check I do with them. And I often, I always allow the participant to, participant to determine different or better decisions. So that is all what I have for you guys. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. Actually, it was, uh, you know, you shared your experiences with, you know, uh, beautiful examples. So you thank you. You could understand your, yeah. uh, because of the examples that you have given. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You're welcome. And uh, for the participants, if you have any questions, please drop into uh, the question and answer box so that we can have the discussion. So I think Deva Pun Pushpam, she's asking, could you show some more example? Sure. Um, the next one I'm trying to do is safety checks. So I have escape room set up. I, I shared that uh, files with Dr. Tamir Salvi, madam. So she should be able to share it with you guys if you're interested, because this escape room have um, stuff that's going to be not very safe for the patients. Like your patient is high risk for falls. I have side rails all up. I have no socks on your patient. I have um, bathroom is not lit, things like that. And I give my new hires like 10 minutes to identify what is wrong with this room. How can you set up this room for a patient with high risk for falls? How do you educate your patient to use the alarm, you know, call bell, things like that. You can set it up whichever way you want. It depends on your objective, what you want your new hires or your nurses to achieve. So if you want to do sepsis, 
you bring them a case study. You don't give them those critical thinking. You look to see whether they are thinking the way that you want them to think, you know. Sure, I will send the slides. How is escape room different from simulation? So that is a very good question. Escape room has clues and puzzles. Simulation, you're, you're there, you have certain algorithms. Okay, so if you are doing ACLS, let's say uh, your patient is on the monitor. I often tell them to remember A, E, I, O, U. So I tell them A is assess, E is EKG leads, I is IV, O is oxygen, U is you do that, you're assigning roles, and Y is why is this happening to my patient? There is set algorithm in a simulation, at least at our hospital, and they have to check all that. They're given the algorithm. So your patient is in BFib, you start that CPR immediately. You shock your patient at 300 first, then two minutes of CPR. Then you shock them at 360. And at this time, you give them epi, all that. So it's uh, in simulation, I have set algorithm. In escape room, they are on their own. They are to find the puzzle. They have to put it together. They have to come up with the plan. What do I do next? There is no set algorithm given for them. So leave this, that's a very good question. Any guideline there to set up? Uh, the only guideline I have is depending on what you would like your people to achieve. That should be a guideline. You have the objective, you come up with an escape route, you run it before you actually do it with the new hires, modify it, Make sure that you debrief. Don't, don't uh, be stuck with guidelines because the very first time I ran escape room, I did it with my kids. And then I knew I need to modify it. So if I look back, I'm thinking I did escape room worse, my very first attempt. Now I'm kind of getting to that, oh, okay, you know, I can formulate this and I can implement it, that kind of more. So it takes a little bit of time, but start it and then it will all come. Because I feel like people from India, we are very creative. We are very creative. So I'm sure you guys will come up with a much better plan than what I just shared. But virtual might lack that interactive session that used to happen in traditional classes. That's from Fire Tablet. That is very, very, that is an issue actually. You know, because of Corona, even yesterday I was talking to a physician and he was saying he missed that physical touch because they are getting the patient to come and do a procedure. Majority of it is done through telehealth. And once the patient comes to the hospital, that final, before taking the patient to the procedure, the physician is doing the physical exam and talking to the patient and all that. So it does. So in virtual, you do lack that interactive, but doing the Zoom, you are somewhat trying to keep that personal touch. But when you translate everything in the traditional classroom to virtual, it does, it does affect things, especially with COVID. I, I can't, you know, because I'm repeating the classes in one day, three, four times, because I cannot bring them all together. I have to separate the classes. And like you said, uh, virtual classes, it, do, it does lack the personal touch, that interaction. So you have to find ways to, you know, to compact that. Thank you. How to adapt concept. Oh, how do we set up uh, an escape room if we don't have a high fidelity simulator? You really don't need a high fidelity mannequin to do an escape room. So 
you know, like hiding the clues. Some of like, you can maybe use your own um, faculty there. The faculty will lay in the bed and act like, oh, I'm having breathing difficulty. And then they come to assess and then the facilitator can say, okay, you are auscultating crackles or you can, um, you know, like even in YouTube, there are lung auscultation sounds. You can say, okay, this is what you hear. So then the student has to link, okay, that sounds like crackles. There might be fluid overload. This patient might be suffering from left ventricular failure, you know, like that. And then, um, you know, one of my friend, she hid a clue in the patient's, uh, I mean, like the mannequin's chest tube or in the Foley catheter. The patient is having temperature and the students or the new hires, they were looking for the source and the source was, the Foley catheter. So she put, okay, the patient's WBCs, things like that in the catheter. Okay. So it's, it's, it, you're all very creative. I'm sure you can figure it out. Oh, thank you. That was uh, Joseph, John, thank you so much for the compliments. Which one is more effective, escape room or simulation? You know, I should say it depends on the person who is actually doing it. I have some people who has all the equipment, but they're still not interacting with the new hires or correcting them. It depends on how you are facilitating it, honestly. You know, with the minimal resources available to hospitals at times, I feel like we did much better job than this high fidelity mannequin that doesn't work sometimes. It says the USB is out, the internet is out, it's not connecting to the internet. This uh, mannequin is from a third party vendor. So sometimes Baylor Hospital doesn't, uh, it, you know, I have to connect, the, connect it to the BSW guest network. So the connection is not always that great. So there is technical issues there too. Effectiveness depends on the facilitator and the objectives and how you are implementing it. Any photo, oh, I, sh I thought of taking some photos, but then I got scared, you know, like they could say, why are you sharing? They won't even let me, if I'm making a PowerPoint, it is hospital's property, actually. So that's why I have to make different ones for us. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. Use of augmented reality in education sector is surging in popularity. If we want to incorporate that in our nursing education, what things we must keep in mind? Augmented reality, uh, Kusum, can you explain that to me? Are you there? Uh, no, ma'am. Mm. She's not. Oh, okay. No. Mm. I, I will take the question from Norma. Okay. I'll come back with this question. Okay. Any, any other question? Ma'am, is there any software support? A software support? I don't know whether. Okay. Uh, let, me sh let me share my screen. I can show you something. I'm hoping that uh, can you see anything? Or am I doing it right? No, no, okay. Yeah. So here. Okay, so the uh, so the screen you can see, right? Since you asked for uh, software support, there is a site that I use with uh, my kids sometime uh, for sepsis classes. So it's called Septris. Uh, it's free. I'm hoping that we can pull it up there too. It's S-E-P-T-R-I-S, -E Septris. And it's a game from Stanford University and it's available, it's free. So Septris, 
click on Septris and see click here to play Septris. So play Septris. This is like the virtual game. So Septris is loading. You have two patients, Mark and Matt. Or at the bottom, you have several clicks that you can use. Physical exam. You can send them for a lab. You can look at the lactate. You can look at the CBC. But you have to do stuff before they get to the very bottom. If they hit bottom, like I, I'll, I'll let Matt come all the way down. And then you will see, it says you, you, know, they, you die, you didn't treat them on time. Yeah. This is a game that I'm hoping it's available there. Okay. Is there any more question? Uh, let me see. <laughs> I think any more uh... Uh, thank you Shaini it is a okay. really a uh, wonderful uh, session and really we enjoyed and we learned what is escape room and how to design an escape room and even the simple concept can be taught to this escape room so that we could understand Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a pleasure. It really was a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. <laughs> so have a great, great rest of the day. Thank you, yeah, guys. Really. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, I can leave, right? Thanks. Oh. I request Surinda sir to uh, deliver the vote of thanks for today's webinar. Okay, good evening to everyone. And I think today's session is very excellent and uh, very excellent presentation. And we've seen that that is different view of the teaching, how we can inculcate in our teaching methodology also. And I consider great privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all wonderful eminent delegates who have joined and become the witness of our memorable session. And today my words is not enough to express uh, gratitude on behalf of Amity College of Nursing and Amity University Gurgaon. I would like to thank to our uh, speaker, Ms. Saini, who accepted our invitation and uh, graced us session with different type of the teaching methods and learnings, how we can inculcate in our teaching uh, classroom and uh, lab teachings also. And I would like to extend a special thank to our Vice Chancellor, Professor P.B. Sharma, sir, or Pro Vice Chancellor, ma'am, uh, Professor Dr. Padmakali Banerjee, ma'am, who, who is permitting and inspiring for us. And I would like to express my gratitude to our principal, ma'am, Dr. Tamil Salvi, ma'am, to provide encouragement and support uh, and giving us an opportunity to organize this event. My heartful thanks goes to my organizing team also, and uh, in team, in Ms. Eba, Ms. Simpi, Mr. Rajkumar, and our IT support team, Mr. Arvin and my colleagues uh, for their constant support. And more than here, we can see here uh, nearby the 500, uh, more than 500 participants uh, participating in this session. And this is in a huge success in uh, itself also. And it, I extend my heartful thanks to all the panelists and all the participants who bless us their presence, their presence. And I once again, I thank to everyone for making this program success and thank thank you very much to join with us thank you very much thank you thank you so much thank you, yeah, thank you.